Well, hey there, Joshua Johnson speaking. It's great to be with you on this Wednesday, June 15th. And here is some of what we're talking about tonight. Interest rates are going up. It's the biggest increase in nearly 30 years. We'll get into how that might affect inflation and see how one food bank is coping with rising prices. The man accused in that mass shooting in Buffalo now faces federal hate crime charges. But how is the community doing? A local activist joins us live. Then, let's be clear, this is not amnesty. This is not immunity. This is not a path to citizenship. It's not a permanent fix. Today marks 10 years since President Obama changed hundreds of thousands of lives, but many of them remain in legal limbo. One recipient of DACA will share her story and her hopes for the future. And pop quiz, what is Microsoft's web browser called? Nope, it's called Microsoft Edge. After 27 years in service, that other one is done exploring the internet for good. So when you pay off your credit card, you're not just covering the costs of what you bought. Unless you pay the whole thing every month, you're also paying interest. That's how the people who lent you money make money. Well, after today, you might find yourself paying more interest. Today, the Federal Reserve raised interest rates by three quarters of a percent. It's the biggest increase since 1994. The Fed raised rates back in March and in May, and that means, generally speaking, borrowing money will cost more mortgages, car loans, student loans, credit card debt, all of it could get a bit more expensive for you. So why do it? Well, today, Fed Chairman Jerome Powell said it's all about controlling inflation. The current picture is plain to see. The labor market is extremely tight and inflation is much too high. We're not gonna declare victory until we see uh, a series of these, you know, really see convincing evidence, compelling evidence that inflation is coming down. And this rate increase might not be enough. Chairman Powell said that there could be another one next month. Inflation in the U.S. is at a 40-year high. We're feeling it just about everywhere we spend money and also where we donate it. Some food banks say they're getting fewer donations while facing higher costs. Let's begin at a food bank in Oakland, California, with NBC's Jake Ward. Hey, Jake. Joshua, when we think about inflation, it is easy to get caught up in the abstract figures. But standing here on the ground at this food bank in Alameda County, where Oakland is, really brings it home. This is a real world face of what it is to live with inflation in America at this moment. And these items in front of me here, part of a box that is given out to each of about 1,200 families three times a week by this operation, represents the shifting of costs in a budget of a household. I mean, we're talking here about Americans who are looking at the price of rice and pasta and milk and saying those prices are so much higher, they're going to blow out my ability to buy gas this month or, God forbid, they might blow out my rent. That's why so many people are coming here. We spoke to people working steady jobs who simply need this to ease the psychological and financial burden of buying food, worrying about its cost. And they described to us just how challenging all that is. Have a listen. The gas prices is, is way enormous, so it's, it's, it's hard for people to get around and people to do what they need to do. Yeah. And this service that they're providing really helps. Food is so high now, you know what I'm saying? The food is so high, and then people don't have, you know, the, the money to buy, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, it's really bad when you can't eat. You know, when your stomach is hungry, it's bad. Prices are going mean, to still go up. The gas prices are still going to go like up. And it's so like overwhelming to know that like we're already spending like $300, $400 extra a month than what we used to before. And then like you look at the news and statistics saying that it's going to keep getting worse and it's overwhelming. Like how much worse is it going to get? 
Now, of course, Joshua, it is not just those people that need the help. It is also the folks that run an organization like this. This is the Alameda County Community Food Bank, but it's not run by the county. It is a privately run donation and volunteer based organization. And here's the thing. Just because their prices are going up doesn't mean that they can pass those costs on to somebody else the way a grocery store can. They have to just eat it. So we're talking here about an organization that before the pandemic was spending about $250,000 a month providing food like this. Today, even though most of this food is donated, the shipping, the labor, everything else costs them about $1.5 million a month. And yet the demand here is insatiable. And you can see it literally tracking with other financial pressures. Once upon a time, about 50 people a day would walk in here to avoid having to pay for fuel. That number is about 150 now as fuel prices have gone up since January. We're looking here definitely at people who really need the help, who are finding that working a steady job is not enough to keep them in their homes, not enough to keep their, their pantry stocked. And that's why this turns out to be so important right now as we emerge from the pandemic. Joshua? Yeah, and especially because costs are so high in the Bay Area. Thank you, Jake. That was NBC's Jake Ward starting us off tonight from Oakland, California. Now let's bring it here in studio and get more into the interest rate hikes with Caleb Silver, the editor-in-chief of Investopedia. Mr. Silver, welcome. Good to see you. Good to be with you. Can we start with the thought process behind this rate hike? The Fed has had to eat a little crow lately in terms of what they thought was going to happen. Janet Yellen, the former Fed chair, said that she thought, she said in an interview last year, she thought it was transitory, that it would kind of come and go. And she's admitted she was wrong about that. How do we know the Fed's on the right track now? Well, we don't. And the Fed's only option right now is to cool inflation by raising interest rates, by raising those borrowing costs. You spelled it out well at the top of the show. So inflation is out of control. They don't have a handle on it. And it said, Chair, uh, Chair Powell says it's because of forces beyond its control. Obviously, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, pushing up gas and energy prices and other factors that are really making prices rise and stay high. We may have peaked, but they're very high right now. Explain how that works. How is it that when the Fed raises interest rates, and these aren't the only interest rates around the world, right? There are many different sure. kinds of rates that affect global markets. But explain how that works. The Fed raises interest rates. That controls inflation how? Right. By raising borrowing costs. If raising borrowing costs for buying a home, you've already seen the mortgage market react. You've seen the 30-year go from 3% at the beginning of the year to over 6% now. Raising the cost of borrowing a car so consumers think twice about making that big ticket purchase. Raising credit card rates so people hold back on spending. But it also affects businesses who borrow money from the debt market to hire, to expand their businesses. They're going to step back from that as well. So let me make sure I understand. So if the if the raising of interest rates makes consumers think twice about buying stuff, then that lowers prices over time because then sellers say, okay, they won't spend X, maybe they'll spend 0.8x or 0.5x and then costs come down? Is that it? We call it demand destruction in economics. So if people stop spending, then we've created de destruction of whatever that good is. So in the housing market, you're seeing demand destruction because existing home sales have fallen for five months in a row as mortgage rates rise. You've seen new cars and used cars, which were hot to trot in 2021, selling like hotcakes, even though prices were high. You've seen that cool down as well. When borrowing costs go up, Consumers and businesses think twice about spending, and that cools inflation naturally. Was this something that could have been prevented? I mean, I remember during the pandemic, during the worst of the pandemic, we're still in the pandemic, but during the worst of it, a lot of people paid off their credit card debt. I think it was something like $800 billion worth of credit card debt vanished. Personal savings kind of went crazy. Is this crazy high? Is this something that was kind of inevitable because of the pandemic? Yeah, this is the other side of the pendulum. We had a lot of that money coming to Americans through those government distributions, the rescue plan, et cetera. So they were able to pay down their bills. They were able to save a lot of money and we weren't doing a lot of spending. As we came out of sort of the lockdown period of the pandemic, we spent with a vengeance. So as we spent more, we created a lot more demand where supply wasn't there to meet it. That's why you got high prices for cars. That's why you got high prices for homes. Demand got very tight but the uh, uh, demand got very high, but supply was pretty tight, which drove prices up. Now, in the energy sector, it's for, for a lot of reasons. We weren't using a lot of energy. We weren't driving a lot a year and a half, two years ago. We are now, and we're flying a lot more, so demand for energy and oil goes up again, and you have constrained supply because refiners had shut down during the pandemic for a variety of reasons. Well, and about that supply-demand balance, the president, President Biden wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal not too long ago where he wrote in part, quote, 
I won't meddle with the Fed, the Federal Reserve, but I will tackle high prices while guiding the economy's transition to stable and steady growth, unquote. That's part of the president's op-ed from May of this year. How much of that is actually in the president's power? I mean, some of the issues with supply chains was a lack of computer chips, right? It, there were cars that were like waiting on assembly lines in Dearborn, Michigan for chips. They had all the other parts. How much of this is actually within government's control as opposed to just the way of the world right now? Yeah, when you think about what is driving prices higher, it's energy and it's food costs. Energy leads to higher food costs. So what can the president do? Maybe he can lower or, or eliminate the federal gas tax. That would be about 18 cents a gallon. But he can also reduce tariffs on imports. You saw the Biden administration do that with solar panels in the last couple of weeks. You saw that market take off a little bit. But those are just things around the edge. Inflation is a natural economic phenomenon that comes on the other side of low demand. Now we have high demand and short supply. That's why we're seeing it. Not a lot the president can do. This is the only thing the Federal Reserve can do, which is independent from the president's office, of course, but they have to listen to the uh, president as well. So some of those tariffs, you know, the New York Times had reported that President Biden was considering rolling back some of the tariffs on Chinese goods that President Trump had put in place. It sounds like from what you're saying that that might help somewhat, but it wouldn't make a world of difference. It wouldn't make a world of difference. We just have a lot of demand for products that we don't have a lot of supply of right now. But on the, on the flip side, you see retailers like Target and Walmart oversupplied with inventory that nobody wants. So this supply-demand equation has gotten way out of balance right now, which is why we have consumer prices at 8.3% and producer prices over 10%. So if producers are paying 10% higher for their prices, they're going to pass it on down to consumers. That gets to something I wanted to ask about. I wonder how much of what we're seeing now with prices, with inflation, is just greed. How much of it is just companies refusing to absorb costs and Wall Street insisting on higher profits. Wall Street's not going to change, right? They're not going to lower their profit targets because Main Street is suffering. How do we know how much of this is just Wall Street being Wall Street? Yeah, well, when you're talking about Wall Street, you're talking about public companies that are responsible to shareholders. So in the case of the oil companies, anything over $50 is pure gravy for them. It's pure profit. They are enjoying some of the best profits in generations. $50 oil. a barrel, you mean? $50 a barrel, uh, sorry, is, is pure profit for them. So is it pure greed? This is what the market will bear. They, oil companies don't set oil prices, but they do control how much they pump and how much they refine, and they just don't want to refine or pump anymore right now. They're enjoying these high prices. Is it greed or are they just making as much as they can because they're responsible to shareholders at the end of the day? A few more things before I got to let you go. With regard to the war in Ukraine, you know, President Biden keeps calling this Putin's price hike in terms of, you know, oil prices. The president's heading to Saudi Arabia next month. Obviously, Saudi Arabia is an enormous energy producer, not the world's top energy producer anymore. That's the U.S. now, but it was the Saudis for a very long time. They're basically in spitting distance in second place. How much of that do you see relief for coming up? We, we don't know what's going to happen with Ukraine, but at least in terms of Saudi oil production, U.S. oil production, would that help? It would help a little bit, but OPEC and OPEC Plus, which are the cartels that really control oil production, have been loath to raise production because they're enjoying these high prices as well. Many of those are state-owned enterprises. They're loving high oil prices right now. They haven't had it for years. Everyone's talking about a recession. The consensus, from what I've heard anyway, seems to feel like next year the recession may hit. It almost feels like a slow motion car wreck to whenever it is that we feel it. What is your sense of what that would look like? I don't know if you agree with the timing, but in terms of what that would look like and how we might be able to kind of ease the impact of it whenever it hits. Yeah, they're terrible to go through, but the thing is you don't know you've gone through it until about six months later, according to the NBER. That said, a lot of folks out there on Main Street, small businesses, folks not earning a lot of money, they think we're in a recession now. But I do think if you look at consensus views and what economists are saying, it is a 2023 event because we're going to have inflation for the rest of the year. The Fed thinks inflation is going to end the year at 5.2 percent. It's going to raise interest rates all the way past 3 percent. You got high inflation, high interest rates, slowing growth. Sounds like a recession to me by the end of the year or early next year. And that is a painful time of economic contraction. And we should be clear, we had very low interest rates for a real long time. So we've had kind of this sort of go-go economy for a while. I don't know, briefly, before I got to let you go, whether this feels like kind of a convulsion in the market or sort of a correction after years of super low rates? This is coming back to normalcy. Talk to anybody that was around in the 1970s or early 80s. We had very high inflation. We had very high interest rates up above 10, 11, 12 percent. So that was pretty high. Now we're only at about one and uh, 
one, between 1.5% and 1.75%, but heading up to 3 to 3.5% by the end of the year. That feels a little bit more normal, but for folks who are used to having zero or zero and a quarter, 0.25% uh, interest rates, that's going to feel very high. And you're going to feel it in your credit cards. You're already seeing it in the mortgage market. Yeah, and you know, whatever counts as normal now. Like, everything has kind of changed from then between automation and, you know, international trade. It's... It's a whole new ballgame, but I appreciate you making time to help explain this to us. My Caleb pleasure. Silver, Editor-in-Chief of Vestipedia, thanks very much. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. And I would love to hear from you on inflation, your questions, and especially your stories. How are these rising prices having the biggest impact on you? What about the interest rate hike that we talked about and possibly another hike to come next month? How might those affect you? And what questions do you have about all this? Leave us a voicemail. Keep it brief but brilliant, please. 888-575-2NBC. That's 888-575-2622. Or email us now tonight at NBCNews.com. Still to come, it has been 10 years for Dreamers. We'll take a look back at DACA and meet a young woman who is concerned about its future for her family's sake. Plus, Yellowstone National Park is still cleaning up after unprecedented flooding. We'll have an update. We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. It has been a long journey for dreamers, the undocumented immigrants brought to America as children. And today is a big milestone for many of them. It has been 10 years since President Obama outlined a new immigration policy, DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program. DACA gave these undocumented immigrants a chance to live and work in the U.S. Now, a decade later, their futures remain uncertain. In a moment, we'll speak to one DACA recipient about her journey. But first, NBC's Zinclay Esamwa shows us how we got here. Our voices hoarse from battle cries, the heat beating us down. Si se puede, si se puede, harsu ita, harsu ita, we can do it. There are at least 10.5 million undocumented immigrants in the United States, DACA recipients or DREAMers. We are more than our documented identity. For the first time, I was able to come out of the shadows. Our communities are going to not just survive, but thrive. Continue to chase your dreams. Don't let your legal situation stop you. Make up over 640,000 of those with the DACA program now in its 10th year. Wu Jung Diana Park is a DACA recipient. So this is just a timeline of all our accomplishments. And as you can tell, it's not finished. The work continues. Yeah, of course. Never, never ends. Today, Wu Jung works at an Asian American Pacific Islander or AAPI immigrant justice organization. But the fate of her tomorrow remains in limbo. When did you learn about your documentation status? I learned I was undocumented when I started applying for colleges and my mom told me to be careful. I was really confused at first. Um, she kept apologizing and telling me that it's all her fault, even though I know that she couldn't have done anything to change it. Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA, is an Obama-era immigration policy announced in 2012. It allows some individuals unlawfully brought to the United States as children to have a renewable period of deferred action from deportation and the opportunity to get a work permit. There are Americans in their heart, in their minds, in every single way but one, on paper. I've done everything that other peers have done. Go to school, working, paying my taxes. Still, Wu Jung says she's faced stigma as a DACA recipient and turned to poetry to process. Our pain, our solidarity. I love you more for your immigrant skin. Beyond the pros, the policy surrounding her status remains contentious. Tonight, the uncertainty for dreamers has only deepened. The first version of the Development, Relief, and Education for Alien Minors, or DREAM Act, was introduced in 2001. For 20 years, over 10 versions of the DREAM Act have been introduced unsuccessfully in Congress. Opponents to the legislation cite the cost of public services for undocumented immigrants, potential fraud, or concerns about encouraging illegal migration. DACA supporters share a different story. 
They're teaching in our schools. During the pandemic, they've been first responders. Roberto Gonzalez has surveyed nearly 3,000 DACA recipients across all 50 states for more than a decade. These are young people from Latin American backgrounds, from Asian backgrounds, from Africa, um, from Europe, who aren't asking for uh, special rights, but only only the opportunity. But Gonzalez says that opportunity hangs in the balance. In 2017, the Trump administration eliminated DACA, which sparked widespread protest. President Biden reinstated the program, but July 2021, a federal judge suspended DACA applications. We're hitting 10 years of DACA. Do you feel more secure? Less? The overall goal for all undocumented folks, all DACA recipients, is a pathway to citizenship. As long as that chance is here, we'll never stop fighting. That was NBC's Zinkle Essamwa reporting. Let's continue now with Indira Islas. She is a DACA recipient and an alumna of the Dream.us program. That group grants full college scholarships to dreamers. Ms. Islas, welcome to the program. Good to have you with us. Thank you for having me. So in terms of what we just heard from Zinclay's piece from those young dreamers who say they will never stop fighting, I'm sure you share that sentiment, but where do you see that fight today? Uh, well, I can say that we're exhausted, first of all. Uh, it's been a long 10 years, and I'm fortunate that I was able to apply for DACA um, when it was implemented, uh, and, and, you know, compared to some of my other DACA peers. Um, we're definitely tired, but... As streamers, we are resilient, and so we will continue to fight until we find a per permanent bipartisan solution. Talk about your journey uh, as a DACA recipient and also coming to the U.S. I understand you came to the U.S. when you were six. When did you become aware of your immigration status, your family status, and, and when did that begin to have meaning for you in terms of what that would mean for your life? Yeah, so I did come when I was six uh, with two younger sisters. I'm the eldest of seven. Uh, my parents were doctors in Mexico. Um, and, you know, for a better life and better future for us, they decided to come to the U.S. Um, and so as the eldest, I always had a lot of responsibility. Um, I found out that I was undocumented when, just like many DACA peers, uh, when we were getting ready to apply for our driver's licenses. And I couldn't when I was seeing my high school peers, you know, get their licenses and apply for their jobs. Um, and I couldn't. And it was then that my dad had a conversation with me and said that I, because I wasn't born here, I did not have a legal status. So you didn't know that before he told you. How did you feel when he, when he explained why you were running into, into these roadblocks? Well, as a 15-year-old, uh, you know, there's not much that you know about the world. Uh, you're just looking forward to living each day, as, as, it, as is any teenager should. Um, but it was very... Uh, it was very sad for me because then I realized all the other challenges that I was going to have to overcome, specifically uh, accessing higher education, which is a whole different challenge that um, uh, coming from a state like Georgia uh, was very hard to overcome. Elaborate on that a little bit. I think for a lot of, <coughs> excuse me, for a lot of folks like me who were born in the U.S. and have never really had to deal with the guts of the innermost workings of the immigration system, we have no idea what you or other immigrants go through. We have no clue because we, we don't have to. Can you paint me a clearer picture of what that's like? Let's just take going to college. What were some of the challenges, some of the roadblocks that you had to go through that maybe I would not have to go through because I was born in the U.S.? Mm -hmm. Well, as, uh, so having lived in Georgia for 18 years, my, pretty much my entire life, uh, in the state of Georgia, we are charged out-of-state tuition after having lived there for so many years. And we are also banned from the state's top institutions, uh, Georgia Georgia Tech and UGA being two of them. Um, and so that was hard, but also uh, financial aid, when it came to financial aid, that was extremely difficult. And, you know, having grown up low income, um, there, was, there was no way that I was going to be able to pay for, for college when education has always been a big part of this American dream. And one of the reasons that my parents decided to come here. And so because of that, I had no other choice but to seek higher education outside of my home state of Georgia. Um, it was very fortunate enough to earn a private, uh, private, privately funded scholarship called the Dream at US, specifically for undocumented students who live in locked out states. 
I understand one of your sisters is a DACA recipient, but the other is not a recipient. She's kind of in this legal limbo. She would be eligible, but the program is kind of in, uh, on hold. It's in flux right, right now. H how is she doing with all of this? It's got to be hard for her. Yeah, it is hard, uh, especially, you know, as me being the, the oldest, um, seeing her miss out on things that teenagers usually look forward to, driving, you know, getting a first paycheck, uh, that's something that she hasn't experienced. And she's almost 20 years old. And uh, because she has the scholarship as well, uh, she's in college going into her third year. And pretty soon she's going to graduate college having a degree without being able to work. Uh, any job and you know still having a degree and so that's why this issue is very urgent uh, because we're we're growing up we're getting older um, and we can't just we can't continue living in the shadows so she's kind of making her way forward through college kind of as a leap of faith like she's hoping that something will happen in time for her to just move seamlessly into the workforce with her new degree Yes, and I think it's up to us, the rest of us, me as her oldest sister, to speak up for her because it's challenging for her to do so. Um, and it's risky as well, you know, not having a legal status. And so that's why um, I'm everything that I do is for her and the rest of my family. What do you want to do? Suppose all of this was resolved today for you, for your sister, for everybody. What door would that open for you? And, and what do you think kind of doors would open for your sisters? Oh, a lot. We have a, <laughs> a lot of aspirations in our family. I am uh, hoping to go to medical school. I just graduated, graduated uh, with my master's in public health and health, health policy. Um, and my next immediate step is to be able to go to medical school. Um, it's always been my dream, uh, following in my parents' footsteps. Uh, my sister, who has my other second sister, who has DACA, will soon graduate and become a nurse. Um, and so we have uh, big plans for our family, and we look very, very much forward to our future. Um, but with DACA being in limbo, um, there's a lot that we have to consider and worry about. Um, but nevertheless, we are very proud and fortunate to be in this country and be able to pursue our dreams. Congratulations on the master's, by the way. I, I was on track to be in medical school at one point, too. That was kind of <laughs> one of my first... It really it was one of my first ambitions before I settled down into something steady like journalism. I'll show you how smart I am. <laughs> I got to let you go in a second, but I know it's hard to envision like what Congress would do because there's so much going on and, you know, lawmakers are highly distractible. But before I let you go, what's the one most important piece of legislation, most important policy shift that you would like to see? Is it just permanent status? Is it a path to full citizenship? What, what would be ideal for you right now before we go? Yeah, definitely a, a pathway to citizenship. Um, like I said, we've lived here our whole lives. Uh, I don't know what it feels like to vote. And I think that that would be one of the biggest privileges of being an American is being able to cast my ballot um, and also being able to travel out of the country without having to apply for advanced parole. There, a lot of us have not seen our family members in, in our, you know, where we were born or, um, in our country where we were born. And so being able to just go back and visit those families for the first time um, without having to pay a fee or give an explanation as to why we need to go, um, that would be one of the things that um, you know would be great to uh, to see included in a package, as well as something for our, our parents, our families, uh, the people who sacrificed uh, a lot so that we could be here today. Indira Islas, I really appreciate you sharing your story with us. I know it's hard to talk about, and I know you've got very high aspirations, but. It means a lot to us that you are willing to tell your story. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me again. And please remember Indira's words if you're thinking about skipping voting in the primary, the privilege of being able to vote. If you're thinking about skipping elections this year or any year, please remember what Indira said tonight. It is indeed a privilege. We'll get to some of today's other top stories in just a moment, including the ongoing recovery from flooding at Yellowstone National Park, an update from the FDA on COVID vaccines for small children and the latest plans for the U.S. to send more aid and weapons to Ukraine. Tonight's headlines begin with historic flooding in Yellowstone National Park. We first told you about this last night. These floods have washed away cabins, swamped entire towns, and knocked out power. Look at those floodwaters. 
In the last few days, the National Guard has rescued almost 90 people. It's easy to see why. And Montana's governor has declared a statewide disaster. NBC's Miguel Almaguer has more. The floodwaters across this community are finally starting to recede, but not everywhere. Some homes and businesses, even vehicles, are under feet of water. Now, that damage, most of it came yesterday as widespread flooding affected this area as well as Yellowstone National Park. Some 10,000 people from the park were evacuated as rivers rose about five to six feet in just 24 hours. There were several inches of rain that triggered this widespread flooding, but it was also snow and melting runoff that really contributed to the rising rivers all across this region. There were no fatalities and no serious injuries, but we had mudslides, rock slides, bridges that were washed away, homes that were washed away. The damage and destruction is widespread. Today, authorities are trying to access the roads into Yellowstone to determine exactly what is still left standing. The park remains closed to visitors, at least for today. And June's a very busy month for Yellowstone. About 780,000 people visit the park this month alone on average. So that's going to be a major delay for folks who are trying to work their way up here. Again, the good news here, no major fatalities, but a massive cleanup is underway. Back to you. That is a little bit of good news. Thank you, Miguel. That was NBC's Miguel Almaguer reporting. Roughly 18 million children will soon be eligible for the COVID vaccine in the U.S. Today, an FDA advisory panel unanimously endorsed both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines for small children. This is the first step in the approval process. The decision now goes to the FDA for emergency use authorization, then to a CDC panel of advisors. The final sign-off would come from the CDC's director, Rochelle Walensky. All of that could be done by Tuesday. Pfizer is proposing its three-dose vaccine for kids six months to four years old. Moderna's two-dose two vaccine would be for kids six months to five years old. We are still waiting for the Supreme Court to rule on Roe v. Wade. It issued more opinions today, today, but not that one. In the meantime, we're learning more about America's evolving relationship with abortion access. New data out today show an increase in the number of abortions in the U.S. for the first time in 30 years. This report is from the Guttmacher Institute, which advocates for abortion access. The increase in demand for abortions got challenging during the pandemic, and that led the FDA to let abortion pills be sent through the mail. Now, online clinics are seeing a spike in pill requests. One patient in Texas told her story to NBC's Isa Gutierrez. This is misoprostol. Um, I took 12 of these pills total over the course of nine hours. Emma, who asked us to not show her face in fear she'd get in legal trouble for sharing her story, lives in South Texas. I was very surprised because I was taking precautions. The 29-year-old was on birth control when she found out she was pregnant last February. I immediately started searching for options to access an abortion in the state of Texas. But just a few months earlier in September of last year, Texas's six-week abortion ban went into effect. I contacted my local Planned Parenthood clinic. They let me know that um, based on my last menstruation cycle, I was already past the six-week mark. Emma says they referred her to a clinic eight hours away in New Mexico. She made the decision to self-manage her abortion with medication obtained from a friend. I was watching these YouTube videos from my home that is no more than two miles from a Planned Parenthood clinic where only six months prior I would have been able to receive care. In December, the Food and Drug Administration lifted a major restriction on abortion pills, permanently allowing patients to receive abortion medication by mail instead of requiring them to receive them in person. There are a ton of virtual clinics that have popped up in the United States ever since um, the FDA stopped enforcing its in-person dispensing requirement. But the future of those clinics is in question. 19 states require clinicians to be physically present for one or more visits, effectively eliminating access by mail. Then there's the Supreme Court draft opinion on Roe v. Wade leaked last month. It looks like roughly half the country will ban abortion within a few months of that decision. We instantly had, you know, like 35 times the amount of web traffic than we did the day before. Robin Tucker is a clinician at Aid Access, a nonprofit that provides access to medical abortion by mail around the world. 
we got an overwhelming surge pretty much immediately in patients who were requesting pills in advance of being pregnant. Unlike many U.S.-based telehealth abortion clinics, Aid Access is able to provide medication to patients in states with tighter restrictions by having the medication prescribed and shipped from overseas. Texas has no jurisdiction over providers in Europe or over pharmacies in India. Um, it can't really do much about it. Still, people like Emma worry about the additional hurdles those seeking help could face in a post-Roe society. I stumbled upon many roadblocks, but I was able to navigate them. Um, I know that there's going to be a lot of individuals who will see it as the end of the path and, and turn around and continue with an unwanted, unplanned, undesired pregnancy. That was NBC's Isa Gutierrez reporting. Ukraine is asking for more weapons to fight off Russian forces. It's about to get more help from the U.S. Today, the Biden administration announced another $1 billion worth of military aid. Well, the war is now focused on eastern Ukraine. Thousands of civilians are still trapped at a chemical plant there. NBC foreign correspondent Ali Aruzi has more from Kyiv. Hey, Ali. Hey, Joshua. So we've been talking about the battle in the Donbass area a lot this week, and it continues to rage on, especially in Severodonetsk, the capital of the Luhansk area. Look, the Russians are pounding that place uh, day and night. They've pushed the Ukrainian forces back into a very small industrial hub of that city. Uh, a lot of civilians are now hiding in the Azov uh, chemical plant, and there are Ukrainian forces on top of that plant trying to protect them. The, the Russians gave them an ultimatum to surrender by 8.30 Moscow time this morning, but they didn't surrender. So they're still holed up in that plant and they're getting shelled very heavily by the Russians. And the UN just uh, issued a report on the situation in Severodonetsk, and they're saying it's really dire there. The entire city has got more than no more than a couple of thousand people left in it. This was a city of 110,000 people. And the UN said that the people that are still trapped in that city are living in appalling conditions, that they don't have any running water, food is very short, electricity is gone, there's no gas there, and they say that people cannot survive under those conditions uh, for very much longer. Uh, the UN said that they had tried to agree to get humanitarian in there and get people out of there, but they couldn't agree on anything with the Russians. Uh, there's only a very small route out of that city, it's very unsafe to get out there, uh, and they just can't get any guarantees to get their people in there safely to get civilians uh, out of there. So the situation is really awful there. And one of the fears right now in Severodonetsk and, uh, and the whole Luhansk area is if the Russians do take it over, if they take Lysychansk, the twin city, over the hill, then they'll have a staging ground to launch more operations on a broader part of Ukraine. And that would be tactically very, very bad for the Ukrainian army. So that's why we're seeing these very bloody street battles going from house to house, block to block in Severodonetsk. And just quickly to fill you in on some news that's come in today, the Telegraph newspaper in the UK is saying that two US servicemen have been taken uh, by the Russians. Now, the State Department said that they're closely monitoring the situation, that they're talking to the Ukrainian authorities. They haven't confirmed it yet. But if true, these would be the first two US servicemen to be taken by the Russians and held as POWs. The fear is that then they would be used as political pawns, pawns and uh, propaganda. I can imagine so. Thank you, Ali. That's NBC foreign correspondent Ali Arusi reporting from Kyiv. Now an update on yesterday's primary elections and some of the candidates that former President Trump was endorsing. Let's start in South Carolina's 7th congressional district. That includes the Myrtle Beach area. NBC News is projecting that incumbent Congressman Tom Rice will, easily, was, will be easily defeated by his opponent, Russell Fry. President Trump endorsed Mr. Fry. Rice was one of the 10 Republicans who supported President Trump's impeachment in 2021. In South Carolina's first district, further down the coast, we are projecting that Congresswoman Nancy Mace will hold on against another Trump-backed challenger, Katie Arrington. Congresswoman Mace was openly critical of the president's actions during the January 6th attack. but She also described herself as a supporter of his agenda. Meanwhile, in Nevada, NBC News is projecting that Trump-endorsed candidates will sweep the statewide pro Republican primaries. Joe Lombardo in the nomination for governor, Adam Laxalt for Senate, 
and Jim Marchant in the GOP nomination for Secretary of State. One month after the mass shooting in Buffalo and the grocery store where it happened is still closed. We'll have an update on the charges the shooter faces and we'll meet someone helping feed the folks who relied on that store. That's all just ahead. Stay close. America has mass shootings so often they can kind of blur together after a while. The shooting at a supermarket in Buffalo, New York, that was a month ago. Since then, U.S. senators have built a framework for gun violence legislation. Tonight, we can report that negotiators say they're still working through sticking points, but they plan to keep at it tomorrow. In Hollywood, hundreds of people have signed a petition urging the industry to take action. They include Judd Apatow, Shonda Rhimes, Jimmy Kimmel, and the president of Lucasfilm, Kathleen Kennedy. Today in Buffalo, Attorney General Merrick Garland saw the damage firsthand. He paid his respects at the memorial, spent time with the victims' families, and announced federal hate crime charges against the shooter. The attorney general says white supremacy motivated the attack. The affidavit outlines how the defendant prepared for months to carry out this attack. It alleges that he selected a target in this zip code because it has the highest percentage of black people close enough to where he lives. At one point, he aimed his rifle at a white male TOPS employee who had been shot in the leg and injured. Instead of shooting the white employee, the gunman apologized to him before continuing his attack. Time may blur for the rest of us, but in Buffalo, the TOPS supermarket is still closed. Its absence is felt every day. And that is why local organizations are helping out. Joining us now is Felicia Brown. She's the executive director of Black Love Resists in the Rust. Ms. Brown, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you for having me. How's it going in the neighborhood right now? How are folks holding up? Um, you know, people are doing the best that they can. People are angry. People are enraged. People are grieving. People are trying to figure out what's next for us in our cities, how to take care of themselves and one, of non one another. Um, yeah. Talk about the community that Top Supermarket served. If we saw it on any other day under normal circumstances, what will we notice? Who would we notice? Paint a picture of that place for me. Mm. You know, it's a community that is a predominantly black community. And, you know, we can talk about Jefferson Avenue as a place where there are many black businesses, many black organizations, and also a place that has been, you know, disinvested in, right, for many years. And so while, you know, I think a lot of the conversation around this tops has been about it being one of the only grocery stores for a large stretch of the city. And so um, it's important for us to, like, really be thinking about that and thinking about how systemic that is and like all the um, just like disinvestment in our community and all of the wealth extraction and all of those things as well. Explain that a little bit deeper for some people who may not pass through a black community that has that kind of a grocery store as a hub. What has that disinvestment looked like over the years? Where, what are some of the places or the services that have been disinvested? Yeah, well, our Black community in Buffalo isn't well-resourced at all, right? And so when we look at some of the services that people need and, like, resources that people need, we are talking about adequate housing, right? We are talking about um, programs and jobs for young people and living wages for just average everyday folks as well. You know, we're talking about high quality education. We're talking about all of um, the, the resources that folks need to be able to thrive. We analyzed FBI data recently and found that in the last decade, hate crimes that take place specifically at grocery stores have surged in the last decade. I wonder what you make of the fact that this shooter allegedly targeted the grocery store and specifically targeted a grocery store with a predominantly black clientele? Mm. Um, for us, 
you know, we know that our communities, Buffalo is such a segregated city. And so, um, again, this is a predominantly black community overall. And when we talk about um, the importance of grocery stores being places where people get food, right? And places, this top specifically was a place where people paid their bills and made sure that they had supplies that they needed, you know, looking at toilet paper and paper towels and those kinds of things, diapers, formula, all of that as well. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of like black people, where are black people safe, right? We can't even go to a grocery store and, and get the things that we need to be able to sustain ourselves without something like this happening. Talk about the kind of help that your organization and others are providing folks after this shooting while y'all are waiting for tops to reopen. What, what are some of the things that are being done to help people meet their needs now? Mm hmm well, one of the biggest things is providing support to people who were um, victims and survivors of the TOPS um, shooting and making sure that people are able to, you know, get their needs met, make sure that their rent is paid, make sure that they are... Um, you know, they have what they need, their mental health needs are being met as well. And then we partner with organizations that are food-based organizations, such as Feed Buffalo, the African Heritage Food Co-op, Urban Fruits and Veggies, um, and other community groups as well, Color Girls Bike 2, the Black Monarchy Foundation, to ensure that we were providing um, what we have been calling food and supply giveaways, on in many different communities on the east side of Buffalo, and then also food and supply delivery to folks, right? And then we've also been canvassing the neighborhood and talking to people on doors and essentially doing wellness checks, knocking on the door and saying, hey, how are you doing? Do you need anything? Is there anything we can help you with um, as well? Wellness checks make a difference. I think sometimes just having somebody show up and see a friendly face to let you know that somebody cares, that can make all the difference in the world. Felicia Brown from Black Love Resists in the Rust. I wish y'all all the best in the recovery from this insane shooting, and I appreciate you making time tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. There are many ways to surf the web today, but one of our first mainstream browsers is shutting down for good saying goodbye to Microsoft Internet Explorer before we go. So were you a Netscape person or an Internet Explorer person? That used to be a thing, for those of you who are too young to remember, which of the two and only two mainstream web browsers you used. Well, Microsoft has a new browser now, and the blue screen of death has finally come for Internet Explorer. The app came out back in August of 1995. Over the next few months, opening it will redirect you to its replacement, Microsoft Edge. And eventually, the old icon and browser will disappear for good. Here's NBC's Harry Smith. It only seems like ancient history. But back in the day, this was the way we connected with the Internet. Days when the Internet was still a vague mystery, unplumbed by the masses. Allison, can you explain what Internet is? During those dark ages came a web browser called Internet Explorer. A search engine akin to the earliest steam locomotive that chug-chugged its way into the World Wide Web with the speed of molasses. Internet Explorer vied mightily with Netscape as the browser of choice. It was a war neither would win because Google came along and crushed them both. Merciless. Few are in tears today. It's not the same as when BlackBerry disconnected last year. Many of us still miss that actual keyboard. No, the death of Internet Explorer is more akin to the obsolescence of carbon paper or VHS tapes. Perhaps someone somewhere, though, yearns for those old days and believes that Internet Explorer will rise again, just like vinyl records. But probably not. Harry Smith, NBC News, New York. 
And by the way, on the off chance you actually do need a website that only runs on Internet Explorer, Microsoft says Edge has an IE mode that can imitate the old browser. Thanks for making time for us. Remember to send your questions and stories about coping with inflation. Our voicemail is 888-575-2NBC or email us now tonight at NBCNews.com. Until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. I was today years old when I heard a eulogy for a web browser. Wonders never cease. See you tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.